Well, it is great to have you with us this morning. Uh, back in, uh, let's see, May, I think when the tornado came through, if you were here, you remember all that. We had to cancel one of our service, uh, cancel our services that following Sunday. And, and so one of the messages that were supposed to be in the Grow Up series uh, was a, an important message because, again, we, we just believe what the scriptures teach. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so this morning, I'm gonna be having the conversation is what does it look like to grow up in the area of our giving? Now, if you're a guest and you came with somebody today uh, because maybe it was with child dedication or a friend and you're like, oh, I finally brought my friend and you're like, no, not the money talk, right? Uh, you, I just want you to know, first off, you can relax if you're a guest. I'm not gonna ask anything of you. Uh, there's no offering plate that's gonna come by at the end of the message. Uh, but what you do get an opportunity is to kind of see what the scriptures have to say about our immaturity or our maturity in the area of our giving. Now, if, if you've been a part of this church for any length of time, you know that uh, I, I have zero interest in ever guilting you or manipulating you to do anything. Uh, we just have a strong belief that if we're going to be a disciple-making church who's going to plant more disciple-making churches, that we've got to talk about disciple issues, discipleship issues. This is a discipleship issue because Jesus says, and he talks about how we view and we spend our money is a spiritual issue. Because he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we want to talk about these heart things. And so we've been talking about that over the last number of weeks. And, and so today, I want to, I want to kind of dive into that. But, but before that, if, if this topic of giving, and you wrestle with it, and you struggle with it, because you struggle to trust God, you struggle to trust the church, you struggle to trust others with your money, it exposes two primary beliefs. Now, now remember this. Our beliefs will drive behaviors. Belief drives behavior. We can know something, but if it's not driving our behavior, it hasn't come a belief yet. So our belief drives behavior. So it, when we don't trust God, when we don't trust the church, when we don't trust others in the area of our giving, it, it exposes two primary things that we really believe. Here are the two primary things. I trust myself more than I trust God. It's just something that's become true for you. You trust yourself over trusting God. The second thing that you'll find to be true is that you believe it's actually your money. You believe it's actually your money. And so my end goal this morning, just so you know, my end goal this morning here today is, is, is to help you understand what does God actually have to say about our money, and then encourage you to just do whatever the Lord says. That's all I want you to do. Whatever the Lord tells you, that's what I hope that you will do. So there, there are two things that I, I need to kind of lay the groundwork. Pretty much most of the time when I talk about this, uh, we'll have this conversation because it sets the foundation for everywhere else we want to go. So the very first thing that, that we need to understand is that God is the owner of it all. We just sung about it. God is the owner of of it all. First Chronicles chapter 29 says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything, Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. So get a load of this. Like, at the Lord's discretion, he owns it all, and at his discretion, he makes people great or not so much. But it's, it's all under the master's hand. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord, and everything in it, the world and all its people, belong to him. So now, so again, scripture's clear throughout. God's the master. God's the owner. He's the author, the finisher, right? Like, so, so God is. So then what's our part? Think about this. If God's the owner and the master, then what is our part? Well, he tells us that we're called to be managers. Look at this. Psalm chapter eight 
It says, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. So God makes it clear. He's the owner. He's the master of all. So he calls us to then be stewards or managers. This is what the New Testament talks about. We're called to be managers or stewards of God's stuff. So that's the second point. God's the owner. We are simply managers of his stuff. So I want you to look at this passage. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, this is how you should regard, you, this is how you should regard us, as servants. Now, this word servant in this passage is different than most other passages where this, serv- where this, this word servant is used. Oftentimes, when we talk about serving, we talk about how we're called to be bond servants, how we're called to you know, be slaves of Christ. Like That word is often used as doulos. That's the Greek word for it. This word is a totally different word. And, and what Paul's trying to help us understand, and what he's stressing here, is that as this servant, we're called to be subordinates under the responsibility of a superior. Well, who's our superior? He tells us in the next two words. We're called to be servants of who? All right, it's on the screen. You can read it. What is it? Of Christ, right. Of servants of Christ and stewards. Well, what's that? We're gonna get to that in a minute. Of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found, what's the word? There, thank you. They're to be found faithful. Critical word. They're to be found faithful. See, now, the word steward can often be translated, and you're going to see one of these uh, in, a, in a few moments, but can often be translated either manager or supervisor. In the scriptures, that's how it can often be translated. Now, a steward had great responsibility, but a steward didn't have any wealth of their own. They were responsible and given authority to take, the, take, to take their master's wealth and spend it according to the master's desire, according to the owner's you know, priorities, his desires, his will, his direction, not his own. So God's the owner, we're his stewards. He, it's his wealth, he entrusts it to us. We're called to spend it according, not to how what we want, but according to how he wants it spent. So as we look at the scriptures, God is distributing his stuff. And he distributes to all of us different amounts, different responsibilities, different amounts of authority, different amounts of time, different family, different kids, like all this different, and he distributes it to us. You say, well, how does he determine all that? We'll kind of get a little bit of a glimpse, but it's always at his discretion. And he distributes. And what's our responsibility? To be what? To be faithful with whatever he's given us. Now, don't miss this part. The scriptures don't tell us to just be faithful with 10%. (laughs) That's what the church is focused on for years. It's unfortunate because it's not like God says, hey, give 10%, Old Testament teaching, give 10%, because I believe New Testament is sacrificial giving, give 10% to you know, the, the temple to the church and then just do whatever you want with 90%. That, that's, that's not what that God would say. We're called to be faithful with 100% of God's resources. So, resources. so the natural question is, so what, do we, what does that even look like? Well, that's what we're gonna look at. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up with me to Matthew chapter 25. And as we, as we look at Matthew 25 uh, here's, here's the beautiful thing. You know, when Jesus said, go make disciples uh, in Matthew 28, uh, he says, go, go make disciples, teaching, you know, of, of all nations, baptizing in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he says, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. So if we're gonna be disciples, we need to understand what did Jesus teach so that we can obey what he's given us. Now, as we look at Matthew 25, this is so important. And I'm gonna explain even more in a few minutes. But I need you to look through the lens. When we're looking at this passage, I hope you have your Bible or pull it up on your phone. You can follow it on the screen if you don't have one. 
But, but, but here's what I want you to do. When you're listening and watching and reading this passage, you need to put yourself in the passage as one of the servants, okay? You need to put yourself in one of the servants. Now, now, here's the other thing I want you to think about, and I'll explain this in a minute. If you are in a, a, a classroom and your professor says to you, hey guys, listen, there is going to be a final exam and I'm giving you the answers right now to the final exam. Now, let me ask you, would you take notes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you would, right? You'd want to be as prepared. Hey, he's giving me the, of course I'm going to be prepared. And you would probably act on that, right? I'm just telling you that final exam's coming, so I'm going I'm to explain that in a few minutes. So Matthew chapter 25, drop down to verse 14. This is Jesus speaking. He says, again, it'll be like a man. He's given a story. Like a man going on a journey who called his servants, that would be all of us, right? And entrusted his property to them. And to one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according, here's his discretion, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. So when the master returned, now remember, Jesus is, is giving us insight of when Jesus returns what it's going to be like. Like when we, and what he's alluding to is the judgment seat of Christ. So when Christ comes back and he gathers us, he gathers the church, and we stand before God, not the great white throne judgment that's down the road. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Only believers are at the judgment seat of Christ. So this isn't, am I saved? Am I not saved? No, no, no. This is, we are saved, and we stand there and say, well, what do I do at the judgment seat of Christ? He's giving us what the final exam is going to be. We're going to give an account for everything he's entrusted us. Some of you have been given five and ten and two and one. Like, we've been given all this different distribution that he's given to us, and then we will give an account for everything that he's given to us. So pay attention. Drop down. So the master gives five, he gives, he gives to one of them, he gives five, and, 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 and the master commends the faithful servant who received the five talents because he invested it wisely. Drop down to verse 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, here's what's so interesting as you keep reading. The master commends the one with five talents and the one with two talents. And he actually, they actually, both the five talent and the two talent, they both receive the same reward. Not the same amount, the same distribution. Why? Because they were faithful. So look what happens with the one with, with two. He says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. See, it didn't matter about the amount. It didn't matter that they, one had five and one had two. That God blessed them both. Why? Because they were being faithful with what was given. And so God you know, honored them and blessed them. And as you read down through the parable, the master says, the one who had one talent just stuck it in the ground. And all of a sudden, he calls him a wicked and lazy servant. Why? Because he wasn't faithful. Are we getting this? Like, like God honors and blesses those that are gonna be faithful with what God has entrusted to them, and he calls the one who wasn't faithful wicked and lazy. Here's the big question that you need to be ready for. Are you being faithful with what God's entrusted to you? And if so, how? That's on the final exam. You need to be prepared to stand before the Lord and give an account for those things. Like, that's going to happen. I mean, have, have you ever found yourself saying, God, if, if, if you'll just give me more, then I'll start giving? God, if, you know, I've, 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 had, I've been preaching for over 30 years, and I've had so many people tell me if they win the lottery, man, I'm telling you, preacher, the first thing that's happened, I'm going, giving it to the church. By the way, I don't do the lottery, ha, 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 like it's a big deal. Like, I'm just like, man, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. 
You know, because here's what we do. God, if you'll just give me more, then I'm just telling you, and here's what I tell people. God doesn't make deals. He just doesn't make deals. You don't tell him if he does something, then you'll do something. It works kind of the opposite. God says, do this. How about you obey? And if God chooses to bless you, great. If God just chooses to honor you, great. If God chooses to allow you to struggle through this world, great. But guess what? Your reward might not be here. It might be later. We don't, we don't believe in this whole thing of, you know, health, wealth, gospel. Here's what I want us to understand. When we choose to be faithful, here's what God says. Well done, good and faithful servant. And hear me on this. When we say, God, if you'll give me, then I'll get, and I think oftentimes God's going, I did give you. Now you're driving around in it. Now you're living in it. Now you, are, you already spent all of it. I did give you more. You've already taken care of the more for yourself. And again, hear me, there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you are first prioritizing his priorities. Not taking care of us. If there's any left over, we might try to figure out how I can help God in his kingdom. See, the problem is, here's our, here's our struggle, if we're just being brutally honest. The problem is, we actually think we're owners, not just stewards. We actually think it's ours. Why? Because we've worked so hard for this money. So guess what? So that when God or the church or some preacher asks for money, you think they're trying to take it from you. How can anybody take it if it's not even yours? See, when we think we're owners, we think you're trying to get some of mine. But when I'm just a steward, I'll let you take it up with the owner. Okay, God, what is it you want? Do you see the difference? Like when, when our, when, when the reason why it says, do not be conformed in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but being renewed, we gotta renew our minds, right? And so we gotta change our beliefs as it comes about this because we're not gonna have the appropriate God-honoring behavior if we don't first change our mindset as we approach the scriptures. In fact, in fact I, wanna, I wanna do this. Sir, can I ask you to do me a huge favor? I won't embarrass you, I promise you. Do you mind just getting up for a second? I'm Bob, by the way. What's your name? Will. Will? I, I, here's, here's what I want to do. Will, come over here so that way you can see it. So I'm, I'm hiring Will. Will, I'm going to hire you as my money manager, okay? This is $100. There's 10 ones, and there's nine tens. So that makes 100 bucks. So here's what I want to do. So I'm going to ask you, whose money is this? No, it's my money, all right? <laughs> This is, a, this is an illustration. I appreciate, appreciate you spiritualizing it. Yeah, I just did all that work to try to tell you it's not mine. Let's just, let's just say this is my money, okay? So, but if, so I'm hiring Will to, to manage my money. This is what God does with us. I'm gonna hire Will to manage my money. So Will, here's, here's $100. Here's what I'm gonna ask. Every month, I need you to give me $10, Okay? I want you to take 10 of my money, the other 10, another 10, and I want you to put it for yourself for your future. So just go ahead, go ahead and give me 10. Thank you, sir. You can put another 10 there. That's for your future. Now, how much money do you have left? 80 bucks, right? You have $80 left. Whose money is that? It's my money, right? <laughs> but I've put 10 of my money in your future, right, every month, and then the $80 of my money is left. Here's what I want you to do, Will. I want you to take care of your family. I want you to spend it on the things you need to. But when I need you to take more of the 80% and spend it on things that are important to me, like for instance, there might be a family in need next to your you know, next door neighbor or somebody at your church or your class or, or whatever it might be, I want you to help them. Or there's a missions thing that I want you to, to fund or, or, or whatever comes up, right? Like I want you to utilize that. But other than those things, I want you to be able to utilize it for the things that you need to take care of your family. Does that make sense? All right, so... Would you take that deal every time? Think about this. Don't have it be $100. Have it be a million dollars. So all of a sudden, now he's got a million dollars. He's giving me 100,000. He's putting 100,000 uh, in the bank, and now he's got 800,000. Would you take that deal every time? Of course you would. We'd all take it. Why? Because it's the Lord's money. He's letting me keep, and we, we complain about the 10%. 
what that, the Lord's letting you really keep 90% of it. And he's saying, hey, I want you to prioritize and fund my kingdom. Now, here's the problem. If I come back to you, we'll say, hey, I want to make sure as you're spending that 80%, I want you to write it down. I want you to tell me where you're spending it, what you're spending it on, because there's gonna be times I'm gonna come back to you and say, hey, Will, uh, I, I would like actually $20 instead of $10. dollars you Are gonna have a problem with that? The times when we have problems with it is when you think it's your money, right? So if all of a sudden you're saying, seriously, you asked for 10, now you're asking for 20? Now, when we just say 20 bucks, it might not seem that much, but how about if the church said, hey, we need 20,000, not 10,000? You're like, whoa, see, it's a problem when we think it's ours. It's not a problem when we say, God, it's yours. The problem is, here's the other problem. We've extended our lifestyle so, so far up to what we make that it's difficult to have any margin. So, so all of a sudden, well, I say, okay, I need $20 instead of just $10. You've been putting 10 away for yourself faithfully. But here's what I've noticed, Will. Go ahead and take this, take that 10 back. When I came to you, now you can keep there. You're not giving me 10 or 20. Now you're just giving me one. Why, why did it go from 10 to 1? And, and Will says, well, well because I, I've, I've got some new things. I've got to pay for this stuff. I've, you know, I've got kids. I've got all this. I've got, I didn't expect the tornado to hit my roof. I've got these repairs now that I've got to make. So, so my question is, why does the owner get less money back? Why, why don't you take less from what you have or from your, your savings account? But why? Because sometimes I'm only getting a dollar. Sometimes I don't get anything. Because the problem is, you think it's your money versus the owner's money. Now, let me ask you one other question, Will, and I'll be done. If, let's, let's say this is, let's say this is a million dollars, okay? And I say, hey, Will, can I look at the ledger? I want to see where you've been spending and what you've been spending on. And you go, I haven't, I haven't kept anything. Now, let me ask you. If you've asked your money manager, think about this in real time. If you've asked your money manager, to write all the stuff down that they've been spending your money on and they can't provide it, would you continue to keep them as an employee? No, you would never do it. You'd fire them. Now, let me ask you even another question. If he couldn't be faithful with the money I just gave him, do you think I would ever be so crazy to entrust him with more? Not a chance. So why would we think it'd be any different? And here's what's interesting. Jesus talks about this very thing. Will, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I apologize, but I do have to take the money back. So, <laughs> Here's what's so cool. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 16, and he really helps us understand what Will and I just tried to model for you. Look at this. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. He said, he also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, a steward. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And so he called him and he said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be managed. In other words, he's saying, hey, you know, I, I've heard all these accusations that you, you've been wasting uh, my money and you haven't been keeping those accounts. So I want you to turn those things in. And bottom line is you're fired. Verse three, and the manager said, and what shall I do since I'm, my master is taking the management away from me and, not, and I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg? And again, I find it interesting. He was too ashamed to beg, but he wasn't too ashamed to steal or embezzle from his owner. Anyway, I have decided what to do so that when I remove from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 100 measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. So think about it. How great. The guy's giving him a discount on his owner's money, right? Like the, He's like, hey, how much do you owe my owner? Don't worry about that. Make it, 50, make it 50 cents on the dollar, which probably isn't a great thing for the owner, but anyway. So then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 100 measures of wheat. He said to him, hey, take your bill and write 80. So he makes it 80 cents on the dollar. Now, Jesus, I want, I want you, I'm curious what you think. Like if you were sitting there listening to Jesus share this story, and this guy's giving discounts on money that wasn't even his, my natural inclination would be, oh, he's gonna get it. Like, like, like he's gotta get in trouble, right? That's not what happens. Look at this. He, Jesus does the opposite. 
the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. In other words, for him being wisely practical. That's what that word literally means. For the, and this is huge. Don't miss this part. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Here, here's what Jesus is trying to drive home. Please don't miss this part. He's saying, I wish the people of God were as wise and as practical with their resources for God's kingdom that the people of this world are for worldly gain. Think about it. He's saying, I wish the people of God, I mean, as we think about our, our, our retirement funds, as we think about our investments, and we're looking at the Dow Jones, and we're looking at the stocks, and we're looking at all these things, and we're, what's going up, what's going down, and inflation hits, and, and what are we going to do, and can we afford, and, all, and there's so much energy, and focus, and attention, and, and strategy, and, and leadership around how do we do this so that we can build more comfort into our life, and how we can have more stuff, and how we can... And God's going, listen, if you would take just the same energy, not even necessarily more, but the same energy you put towards creating worldly gain towards godly kingdom purposes, how much more do you think the kingdom would be winning? Like we have a responsibility and we're going to be held accountable before the Lord for this very thing. And he's giving us some insight through this passage. Now drop down to verse 10. He said, the one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. See, that's why it doesn't matter if it's a million or it's a $10, if it's $5 million, if it's $50. Like it, the amount doesn't matter. The question is, can you even be trusted, whether it's a little or whether it's with much? Will you be faithful with a little and with much? Come on, parents, how do you know your kids can be trusted with a vehicle? Think about this. When you're, when you're raising your kids and, and, and it comes to that age and, and you're thinking about entrusting them with the keys to your car, like, were they faithful? I don't know what they had. Did they have a bike? Were they faithful with that or did they leave it out to rust all the time? Were they faithful to take care of their rooms? I'm telling you, pay attention. You'll see a, a very similar thing. Look at their room, look inside the car. Oftentimes, they're one and the same. Were they faithful to take care of a responsibility that you gave them? With a little, can they be entrusted with more? If you, if at work, and you think about if you run a sales team and, and, and you're wondering if, if, if this particular salesperson can, can handle a larger client, I'm just, here's one of the questions I would always ask. Were they faithful with the smaller client? Yeah, we can talk about ability and all that other kind of stuff, but were they faithful? Because they, they might have tons of talent and ability, but if they weren't faithful with the smaller client, I'm, there's no way I'm giving them the larger client. It's just a principle we see in Scripture. I remember God convicting me of this early on in ministry. And I, I, I was a senior pastor in my late 20s, and, and uh and so just trying to learn and, and grow and develop as, as, as a leader and before I was a student pastor. And, and, uh, and, and I remember so vividly, God brought such conviction that, Bob, do not focus on the size of the church. Do not focus on the size of your ministry. Do not focus on the size of your platform, because if you do, you will use people. But if you will just focus on being faithful to me, I'll determine what I believe you can handle. And I have just chosen to trust God and let him do whatever he wants. If he wants to grow his job, that's his, that's his job. But if I was so focused and worried about certain size church and certain size ministry and all that other stuff, the natural temptation would be to use people to get my end agenda. There's no end agenda. At the end of the day, God determines it. Why would I do, want to do anything else other than what God wants? And so he goes on, verse 11, he says, if you then have been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? 
Are you faithful with other people's stuff? When somebody lets you borrow a vehicle, do you return it? With the gas filled up, will you just turn it in better condition? Do you handle other people's you know, possessions with great care and make sure it's returned in just as good a condition or better when you return it? Like how you handle other people's stuff. When you go to somebody else's house for a small group, do you make sure that their house isn't trash, like, like it's not trash, but it, like it's not uh, just left for them to take care of everything? Who wants to host the next week after that? Like, what does it look like for us to take care of and care for other people's stuff? I remember uh, a number of years ago, we had, we had purchased a house. We were going to put a bunch of sweat equity into it, and, and uh, we had decided we were going to put wood floor. Actually, Sue had decided we were going to put wood floors, and uh, so that meant I had to figure out how to do this, right? So I had a buddy that was really good with his hands and did all kinds of stuff, so I'm like, hey, will you help me? Show me how to do this. I want to do it, but will you show me how? So he started showing me. And so I said, hey, would it be possible for me to borrow your big table saw? So he's like, sure. And he did all this. So the, the, the blade on the table saw was, was pretty good. It, it had been definitely used quite a bit. There were still teeth to it. But so I was able to use it for, for a good half of the, of the thing. But then I had to go buy another uh, blade to finish out the work. Now, when I returned it, the blade that was on there that I replaced was already better than the blade that he gave me. So when I returned it, I went and got another blade to make sure there was a, an additional one. Why? Because I want, first, I wanted him to know how incredibly grateful I was that he trusted me with this big piece of property that he had that, that, that helped bless my family. And guess what? The other thing is that if there was anything that would ever come down the road that I might need, I also wanted him to feel comfortable to know that Bob's responsible and trustworthy, that I could trust him with this piece of equipment. And the question is, do you see that in your own life to where God or somebody else has given you something with somebody else's possessions and you've been so faithful to care for them? I remember when I was a pastor in Austin and uh, we, were, we were in a portable church, meaning we met in a high school. Ten years. It was really hard. <laughs> Set up, tear down every morning, rolling carts in. You, some of you have been part of those kind of churches. It, it's a lot of work. This is how this, this campus started. This, they used to meet at the elementary school down the road at Hopper. And uh, for a few years, they set up and tear down every morning. And it's hard. But here was the thing that I would tell to our staff and to our leadership and our church. I'm like, listen, I want to make sure the principal of this, of this high school and the teachers of the classrooms and the areas that we use see us as a blessing, not a pain in their rear end. Because here's what I know would happen. Their teachers are gonna come in Monday morning and if things aren't where they're supposed to be or if stuff is broken or if, if, if they have to do anything out of the ordinary, it's gonna be an annoyance of that church that meets in their classroom. That's the last kind of testimony that I want in people's minds. So I was like, we want to do everything we can to honor them, bless them, care for them, so that one, it leaves a good taste in their mouth, not a bad taste. So we would even leave books in the room, and we would tell all the teachers, hey, if anything is not exactly where you want it, if anything is missing, if anything is broken, will you please write it down? We'll, get, we'll make sure it gets taken care of. And then every Christmas and every May, we would always give them gift cards and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Why? Because we wanted to be good stewards of the areas that we were given. Here's the other thing. I really believed that if we couldn't learn how to be grateful and appreciative and take care of the school we were meeting in, why in the world would God give us our own property? Why would he give us our own building if we couldn't be faithful in the space that we were presently using? And again, thankfully, God helped us buy land, and we were moving in that direction before I left. And so, again, I just believe that when you are faithful to carry out the principles of what God invites us to do, when you take care of another's, then he might be willing to give you your own. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, let me ask you, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but if I were to ask you to raise your hand, if you think you serve your money, 
Now, high majority of people would probably not raise their hand. Because most of us are like, that's weird. I don't even know what that means. How do you serve your money? Like, I serve God, I serve my family, I serve my, the company I work for, but I don't serve my money. And here's what I would say. I think God would say, are you sure about that? If you struggle to have any financial margin, potentially, you're serving your money. If you're constantly saying, I would like to give, but I just can't. I would like to be more generous, but I just can't. Potentially, you're serving your money. If you find this topic, like when we bring up, hey, we're gonna be talking about giving and you roll your eyes or you look at your spouse or you look at your whoever brought you or whatever the case is and you're like shaking your head or whatever it is or it causes stress in your relationship or your marriage, I'm just telling you, most likely you're serving your money. If your prayers are ended up being a lot like this. God, please help me, please bless me, please provide more for me because the reality is you think it's about your kingdom and you're trying to get God to show favor to your kingdom. But what would it look like if our prayers started, and it's okay to ask the Lord for money, that's not a problem, but what if it starts looking like, Lord, help me be reminded that you're the owner and I'm a steward of all that you've entrusted to me. Will you please help me be faithful with what you've given me for your kingdom purposes? What would it look like if we just started praying that and started walking that out? See, let's be honest. The, the question isn't whether or not God can be trusted. And even though there's been all kinds of problems with churches and all kinds of, all kinds of issues, um, the, the question, I'll, I'll, I can say with integrity with this church, the question is, is not, can this church be trusted? The question is, can you and I be trusted? And when I say I, meaning Bob, the follower of Jesus, not the pastor, because I am trustworthy as your pastor, but I just want you to know, I'm in the same boat as y'all. I sit in these same seats, and I'm just as accountable as you are for what God's given me is, is, is what God's given you. And so it's in this journey, this pursuit of following after Jesus, of saying, am I being faithful with the resources that God's given to me? So here's the two action points. Here's two action points, and then I'm gonna let you go. First thing, here's what I want you to do. Be faithful to pray. Be faithful to pray. If you consider this your church, if you consider this your church, then the prayer request isn't, should we give? That's off the table. You don't even have to pray about that. It's the same thing with serving. When we talk about serving, if this is your church, you don't have to pray, should I or should I not serve? No, 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 Jesus has already called you to serve. So now you're just praying, where do I serve? That's what we pray about. Same way with giving. I don't have to pray, should I give? No, no, no. The question is, Lord, what's the percentage that you want? You've called me to sacrificially give. Is it 10? Is it 11? Is it 12? Is it 15? Is it 12? I don't know. Whatever the Lord wants you to do. What's the percentage that God is asking of you? And here's what I tell you. Don't have the mentality, dear Lord, What's the minimum I can get away with and you still be happy? That's not the prayer. You know, here's, here's something that Sue and I did. You know, when, when uh, we had our capital campaign about a little over a year ago and we're trying to raise funds to build another facility and, and um, we'll be talking more about that in the fall and, and into the spring. Uh, but, but as we're trying to raise this, and I'm giving all these messages, here's, here's why we need it, here's our growth, and here's everything that's happening, and all that kind of stuff, and casting vision, and, and, and asking people to pray. And so I told you, Sue and I are going to pray too. And so I, my belief was, Sue, I need you to pray and ask the Lord what he wants us to give. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord what he wants us to give. And I just believe the same Holy Spirit that resides in her, that resides in me, will give us unity, okay? So as we were praying about this, I, I want you to think about this. You know, when we were talking and I said, put 10% to the owner, 10% for your future, and 80% for you, 
what we do oftentimes when a capital campaign or a missionary or somebody else is in need, what we do is I'm gonna take it from the 10% from the owner and I'll knock him down to about 7% and I'll give that other 3% over here. Meanwhile, you keep putting 10% faithfully for yourself and you keep spending all 80% for yourself. And what God calls us to is, no, 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 you keep honoring the Lord because my giving and Sue's giving to the, to the Lord, our tithe and all that kind of stuff is not gonna change. Like, it's only gonna go up. So that, that, that percentage, that, that's happened because God's been stretching me there. So we're, we're, we're giving there. Then for the capital campaign, it had to come from that other 80%. So guess what? Then it's questions like, what are we going to start going without? Do we need to sell something? Do we need to downsize? Do we need to, like, we're not going to take away from the Lord. It's his. So how do we take away from us, which is super uncomfortable, and what do we choose to go without so that then we can choose to fund the priorities of God? And I'm just telling you, I'm not going to tell you the amount. We, God put on both of our hearts the same amount and was unbelievably uncomfortable. This is the most we've ever given and we're continuing to give because I just believe at the end of the day, it's all God's and he will provide for his kingdom. Our job's to be faithful with what he's given, which is the second part. So be faithful to pray. The second part is be faithful to give whatever God tells you to give. Come on. Maturity requires obedience. If you were to tell your kids, and I'm gonna wrap up, if you were to tell your kids, hey, they come to you, hey, dad, mom, I, I need more money. Okay, I need you to do some chores. I want you to do this, this, and this, and I'll give you your money. And so like, they come back to you and say, hey, can I have the money? Did you do your chores? No. You might, you might go, oh, okay, I feel really bad. That's not the heart of God, okay? I'm just telling you. So there might be grace, but th- for me, that would be enablement. So for me, I'm like, no, I'm not giving you money. When you do those chores, like I said, then I'll entrust you with the resources, The same is true with our heavenly father. Hey, I've given you this. Don't ask for more if you haven't been faithful with what I've already given you. So just pray and you ask the Lord. This is on you. This is on you. I don't know what anybody in here gives. I have no clue. All I know is what Sue and I give. I have no idea. You give whatever God tells you to give. And I just believe we'll be good. So here's the last thing and I'll be done. Uh, there's a video coming out tomorrow um, that we made because you have the opportunity to help us save about $80,000. Here's how. Uh, most of our giving, is, this is great, by the way, 90% of our giving comes online, which is great. That's how we do ours. We do both our capital campaign giving and our tithing to the church, both online. If you do it with a debit card or a credit card, there are bank fees because 90% of our giving comes online. We pay $80,000 in bank fees. Now, if you're in the banking industry, forgive me, but I don't want you to have that money, okay? Uh, I'd rather it go for kingdom purposes. So here's what we're asking. We're sending a video out to say, hey, if you can change your giving, keep it online, but just make an electronic transfer, make it a bank transfer uh, versus a credit card debit, or, 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 or if you wanna keep it that way, you've gotta accept the charges versus uh, giving those to the church. If you don't wanna change anything, don't change anything. We've budgeted for it. We're just trying to say, man, what a great way to save 80 grand to let the church know, hey, you have an opportunity to help us save $80,000 by just simply changing it over to a bank transfer. So anyway, you do with that whatever you want. If you wanna give, there's way, plenty of ways. We tell you all the time, envelope with the check, you can uh, online, you can click the thing. Uh, we just want you to obey whatever God says because we just believe if we're gonna be a disciple-making church, we have to grow up in every area. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much. Thank you for a church who always responds so generously uh, throughout the year. This isn't, this isn't a message from a place of despair. This is a message uh, that is preparing us for what's to come. And so God, I truly, this is not, you know this, This is truly not what I want from anybody. This is truly what I want for people. Lord, you have have so impacted my life with having four kids, making very little money, trying to make ends meet, trying to prioritize your kingdom, and you just always provide it in miraculous ways. And God, I, I want those stories for everybody. I want them to see your hand and how you moved in powerful ways and, uh, and so, God, would we just be people that just choose to trust you?
like you're the owner, we're the steward, you set the priorities, and we just take your resources and see them funded for your kingdom purposes. Because at the end of the day, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.